We are back uh, to Live from the Heartland, coming to you every Saturday morning between 9 and 10 on Chicago Sound Alliance, WLUW 88.7 FM. Uh, just so that you know, uh, your last, you are to register to vote this week. Period. It's time. Uh, if you have not registered to vote, you can do it right here at the Heartland once I get off this stage, or you can do it anywhere else that there are people willing to register, folks. Tuesday is the end of uh, the broad voter registration. This Tuesday, October, I mean... Here in um, Illinois. Yeah, here in Illinois, October And how long 8th. can we vote in advance? Uh, we can be early voting. Um, early voting starts at the end of this week, I believe, and it goes right up until the Saturday before election. Um, so you heard about that with David Orr last week. If you want more details, go to David Orr's uh, website, cookcountyill.gov, and you can get all the dates. There is also a grace period for uh, registering, but you have to vote when you register at one of the sites that are limited. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's it on the voting thing. Well, Michael Katie and I and went I, to a yeah. play last night. We went to a play called Unnatural Spaces down in um, uh, Logan Square. And uh, it was great, Koya. Um, and so we're welcoming to the stage right now, Koya Paz. Good morning, darling. Good morning. How are you? Um, wow, you are so good. I'm fine, thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. I wrote these uh, funny little notes, uh, including things... Um, what do they know that I don't? Zombie apocalypse, plastic bag curtain, C, shoot, spoken word, no 40 <laughs> acres. I mean, this was a great piece you put together. Thank you. Did you have fun? Oh, yeah, we had a great time. So Unnatural Spaces is a project of the Guild Literary Complex's Poetry Performance Incubator, where we bring poets from all over the city together to make a play in an intensive year-long process or 10-month process. We started in early January doing this. And, you know, one of the things that we kind of struggle with in the project is that that doesn't sound very fun, right? Oh, poets coming together to make social justice this theater about the environment in this I, case. I'm weird. It sounds but, like fun to me. but Well, I hope so. You know, But the reality is that um, one of the things that poets do is look for the really specific and the really human. And often when you are really paying attention to the, the sort of uh, contradictions of humanity, that's quite funny. You know, there's a lot of humor in that. So we've, we've tried to be really generous and human and also tackle questions of environmental racism, which is what the play well, is about. Well, my take on the whole thing was reveling in the contradictions. Yeah. I mean, it's like uh, in the play you have, uh, you know, people just uh, who want to do good in the world and uh, follow environmental, uh, you know, directions and eat well and take care of their kids in the proper manner and do things. But also sometimes it's just not convenient. Uh, and uh, you, you in your own promotion on the play, you talked about how... Uh, in green was really something just about uh, garbage and recycling and maybe you ride your bike but in the course of putting together this play you really saw the connections on a macro level and how uh, how metal is tied to guns and how uh, food is tied to test scores etc do you want to share a little bit about your uh, your own ed growth in the process of putting this together? Sure. Yeah, one of the reasons I was interested in making a play about environmentalism is because even though I'm progressive, I'm, I'm heavily involved in a lot of different kinds of activism, environmentalism never came to the fore as a priority for me. Um, I'm, I'm much more interested in questions of immigration rights, uh, prison industrial complex, things like that. So I thought, oh, well, environmentalism, that's nice, but things are more urgent. But um, I also know that the the planet is a non-renewable resource, maybe. We've been thinking a lot about the question of remediation and that Earth can renew if we treat it right. So we're not entirely hopeless. Um, but I will say, I'm actually going to um, introduce my colleague, Senio Ador, who was here with me, because he is one of the people in the project who came on and really helped push my thinking past that, because he has a really hardcore systemic analysis, right? And he was great in the play. Well, yes, welcome. Thank you so much. Welcome to Live from the Heart and Land, Senio. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good Good morning. Good morning. I think the beautiful thing about unnatural spaces was um, it forced me to c to come at the problem of urban toxicity not from uh, 
an environmental standpoint, but from a human to human um, standpoint, how do we uh, engage each other um, from person to person in toxic ways? Like, how do those things come up? Um, relationships and things like that. So, I'm a, I have an engineering background. And you play like and an I, engineer in the play. And I he play does. like an engineer in the play. Going off the grid. Exactly. And um, I try to bring a lot of those emotions that I felt as I was, I was working as an engineer into, into the play. You know, was to that, see was that liberating for you, the process you just described? It was, and it was also uncomfortable in a lot of ways. Because uh -huh. even though I do have a technical background, um, I also felt like I had... Um, certain sentiments as far as community and activism were concerned and once I was thrust into that environment I had to kind of uh, re reevaluate where I actually stood you know versus where I wanted to stand well you know one of the things I always like about Koya's plays and I've seen a few is the sets and uh, you know like the backdrop of uh, plastic bags in this one um, and I still don't know what those little lights were when people were uh, bringing them out in the water, how you did that. But one of the things is you had this flying machine contraption that uh, unfortunately that you didn't have the lights lighting up on it. But it, it looks like you're about to pedal this thing off into, the, into space. And that, that, that's also something that um, I tried to bring up. It's a contraption, a bike that I flipped upside down, ran into an alternator and some batteries. Oh, and you built it? I built it. Ah. <laughs> but, but this, this is the thing about Senio, right? Is that we'll be at rehearsal and he's like all of a sudden like going into this incredibly detailed analysis of how water pipes work or how That'll electricity works. Engineers. <laughs> and yeah, we don't understand anything he's talking about, but it's also fascinating. You know, he's like, and then I'm gonna connect this alternator to this. <laughs> but then Great. the reality of it is you, you connect it and as an engineer it doesn't always come together exactly when you want it to come together, right? So like that's the beauty of it as well. And just staying with it and um I think with poets and um, actors that may not have had exposure to that, that's also something that you kind of learn. Because I also mentioned that, you know, it's not it's not magic that makes your lights cut on. It's actual science. You have to sit there and work at it, and to just expose them to that process in a real way has been well. Liberating. One thing that definitely worked, Senyo, was uh, you uh, falling into your father's <laughs> dialect and lecturing yourself about. Oh really? What is that dialect? It's it's a uh, Ghanaian. Ghanaian. Uh -huh. Yeah, West Africa. Yeah, that was really wonderful because <laughs> basically it's the father, an, an immigrant to this uh, place we're in right now, talking to his son who wants to go off the grid and saying, "Oh really? You <laughs> want to go off the grid? Right. And, and you want to pull <laughs> up firewood and carry water every like day? Like the old days. Right. Was, exactly. It was really a wonderful piece. That that little piece. Thank but you. I gotta mention. Pink slime. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dang, she was good. Dang, she was good. Yeah, she Tell was. Tell us about pink slime, Koya. All right. Well, when we started writing the play, was around the time that the kind of scandal about pink slime broke, where suddenly everybody was, you know, freaking out about pink slime and sort the of this food, the quasi food found in uh, school cafeterias. Right. This kind of ground up meat byproduct that's been disinfected with ammonia and then recirculated in a lot of highly industrialized food situations: schools, prisons, uh, <laughs> fast food restaurants and um, so this we were talking a lot about pink slime and one of the poets um Donna Rita Helpant, who's just a really brilliant poet and performance artist. She was great. Created a character called Pink Slime, in which we get to hear from the perspective of Pink Slime how you kind of, uh, how she came to be and how she feels it's unfair. Like you invited me. You created me. You brought me in. And yeah. now you want to get and, rid of and me. And pointing out that the reality is that, you know, you know, sort of the anxiety. Ammonia, for example. Ammonia is found in a lot of uh, packaged food products. The right. reality is that anytime you're buying your food in a package, has been treated in some way that's probably really alarming when you think about it. One of our other characters talks about, like, great, there's lice poison in my ice cream. You know, right. we're so spooked, we're going to be eating nothing but lettuce soon because you know, the, the reality yeah, is that the so way we produce food is really alarming. And so, but Pink Slime, you know, we were sort of laughing yesterday because she's meant to be this kind of like creepy, horrifying character who comes to life, but she's so charming and funny and she's really makes a case lovable. for herself. You know, she makes a case for Pink Slime. 
time that she said we were talking yesterday over drinks. She's like, I'm not sure I want people to have the takeaway that pink slime is okay. Though she does point out that we'd have to kill 13 million more cows per year um, to make up for the sort of um, not using that quote unquote waste. Yeah. So if you care about cows, for example, or methane or all the other things that sort of a lot of cows do to the environment, you might rethink pink slime. I don't know. Well, she just, she moved as though she had no backbone. She was incredible. <laughs> she, she really... Oh, yeah, she worked on that. That the only bone she has in her body is her clavicle. Yeah, and, and that's what she worked on. Just incredible. This Word, go ahead. Oh, was, go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> hey, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. You go. Okay, uh, one of the things that uh, I liked is that you were uh, you brought in uh, a number of uh, actors, uh, some of whom had not been on the stage before. Oh. And do you want to share us a little bit about that? Where did everyone come from? Are they all involved in uh, in poetry, in theater? Uh, was this the first time on the stage for some? Uh, they were all very good. Some would need to work on their uh, their. You know, not loud Projection. enough. Projection. Projection is the word. Tell us about that as a director, working with folks. Yeah, so this, the goal of this project is to bring poets together. Poetry is usually a kind of solitary artistic practice, and then maybe you bring the poem to an open mic or to a featured reading. Um, but we wanted to bring people together to write together and to write for each other and write in multiple voices and multiple rhythms. And so when I was casting, I was looking for not just the people who show up and are the best performers. That would be an easy way out. I was looking for the people I thought really had something to say or bring a different perspective to the process. And so the result is that we have some people who at the audition were so scared to be speaking in front of a group and there are maybe 20 people at the uh, at the final callback that you were attracted to them well I thought it was such a brave thing to do you are so scared that you can barely get words out and yet here you are auditioning for this performance process uh. that's a kind of courage I want in the project you know and to see those people now on stage you know so scared you know and, and Senyo can speak to what this process is like too to sort of be thrust into the play yeah I have no acting or performing background whatsoever. Um, You're going to be an engineer? I'm going to be <laughs> going to be an engineer. So um, being being thrust into this program um, and creating beautiful language around urban toxicity, but not only um, creating the language, but creating relationships with the rest of our colleagues kind of lifted the entire um, production in itself. So we weren't just writing about, you know, urban racism and environmental racism but I think at the end of the day it was an exercise in like growth and being able to express the things you feel um, on a large platform because that's the translation from having the intellectual discussion to actually doing something about it you know so if you can't speak on it, um, it's going to be hard for you to get out well, there and do something. Well, I think you'll probably figure it. out ways to, to mix your uh, environment, your uh, engineering with your theatrical skills. Yeah, right now I, I help out at, um, I don't know if you're familiar, with Black Oaks Center in Pembroke, Illinois, and it's a sustainable oh, living. Well, I, know them, yes. I yeah. know them for their agriculture. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. the, when, I, when I showed up, I had already been two months in helping out there, and that was some of the, the um, emotion and the sentiment that I tried to bring you know, to the program. Well, that's, you know, that you mentioned the Pembroke farmers is, uh, you know, you're, hopefully you could be a connection because we'd love to have them on the show. This is a, basically a black community, mm -hmm. and there was a black rodeo that came That's out of there, too, yeah. uh, that uh, people should know more about. It's That's been right. down near Kankakee. Yeah, we'd uh, love to have them up here on the show sometime. And probably make a connection to our kitchen, and too. And get our food, again. Get, get some farm to take stuff. I had a question of Koya. Uh, one of the things that I, I always kind of push whenever I see one of your plays, and um, this, this play opened on uh, the 5th, it closes on the 28th, and people should tell people how they can come see it. But I always wonder, you know, you put all this work into it, and then it's over. So is there a way that you can maybe take this on the road? This would be great in parks. This would be great uh, taking it around. It's a, it's a message that people are just beginning to grasp, you know, the really the, the comprehensiveness of well, environment and food and all that. It could get extended, you know. 
Well, maybe. I'm maybe. asking her. Well, you know, some of it we have to see how many people actually come to see the show. Again, a bunch of poets making a play about environmental justice speaks to a very small, immediate community, although the play, again, is quite funny, very human. Um, we really tried to model a range of ways into the issue and, and to be very understanding. I'm very open to touring the show and taking it around. I think the Guild would love it. We're also part partnering with Voice of the City, which is a community um, art uh, organization uh, but the reality is sort of finding those partners and coordinating nine people one of the things I always say when we're making work like this and I do exclusively kind of community engaged social justice type work is what I'm passionate about is that we have to make our art fit into our life not the other way around you know we, we all have you know kids jobs multiple jobs we're taking some of our actors take three buses to get to rehearsal you know it's and that is actually a line in the play. Yeah, itself. it is. And when you want to make art with people who are not sort of having the privilege to live their life as artists, right, where that's their work, it becomes much, much harder to think about these sort of broad scale, um, you know, projects. Uh, Koya Paz, uh, how can, I know you, you know, uh, you're teaching at DePaul in the theater department, and um, how can people find out more about you and also your you are a commentator on Vocalo Radio, which partners with, uh, with our station, WLUW, as well as BEZ. Tell us a little bit about that and how you, when they can hear you. Well, very easy to find on the internet, koyapaz.com, which will link you up with everything you ever wanted to know about me. And more then, than you want to know. More than maybe. Depends how much you want to know.